a quick update on the status of Ember CLI deploy. I'm Mattia. And I'm Aaron. And uh, a few months ago, Aaron and Luke were here at the last Ember camp announcing Ember CLI deploy 0 0.5. You have to notice the pants. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I, I should buy Canadian ones. Uh, so what happened since then? We did uh, a few things. That day we released 0 0.5, that was a complete rewrite, and we moved to what we call the pipeline architecture. And uh, this is, the idea is that each deploy is a series of steps, and what we can do is that we can enable you to install different plugins, and each plugin can implement one or many steps, and the combination of the plugins and the pipeline running will produce your deploy. And then, in February, oh, you have the wrong emoji. Ah, anyways, in February, we released um, um, a quick update that did uh, a few niceties. So we added a progress bar. We added some extra deploy hooks. We now better support .env, and we allow you to configure log scholars, and uh, we allow you to, we will basically validate your config and tell you if you don't have plugins any plugins that implement certain hooks, so that because some commands will require you to have certain plugins, and so we just detect that. And then, yeah. So <laughs> today we released the uh, first beta of, of version 1.0. Uh, there's a couple of cool things in there. I guess the main one, or well, we did this really just as an excuse to actually write some code. That's why we're talking today. It was a conference-driven development. Um, essentially, the main big thing here is um, uh, we've we've improved the plugin control. So Previously in the config, when you wanted to run multiple plugins, run them in different orders or disable them, there was a in the config a, a plugins property, which was quite confusing because it just took an array uh, of strings, and that essentially let you disable plugins by not adding the, the name of the config into the array. Uh, it allowed you to reorder them, and it also allowed you to, to run multiple instances of a plugin by aliasing them. It was completely confusing. Most people um, screwed it up. So uh, thanks to Ed Faulkner doing most of the work, we've um, now improved that so you can specify the run order by um, just doing pipeline.run order. Um, S3 runs after um, Redis or whatever. You can um, disable them by just setting the, the disabled true for, for any of the plugins, and you can also alias them. So it's a much more improved way of controlling those plugins. And we've got some new docs. So uh, they were not particularly easy to read before. Uh, most people didn't understand that you needed to look to aliasing if you wanted to run uh, a, a, a single plugin more than more than once, so um, we've improved that to, to kind of be directed more at the, the way you guys use uh, Embassy Light Deploy. Uh, we've got the, uh, we've improved the, the output for the, the listing of revisions a bit more like Heroku now, um, thanks to Mattia. Um, we've got a, a cool webhook plugin which allows you to, to ping different uh, webhooks, so Simplabs and, and Mike worked on that, which was awesome. And we've now we've got community badges as well, so you can um, on any of your add-ons you can you put some code into your your README, and it basically says what version of Ember CLI deploy this this particular plugin works with. Ah. And since last Ember Camp, um, we've had a bunch of different contributions to to the core plugins and uh, Ember CLI deploy itself. Um, we've had a bunch of releases, 61. Loads of new plugins since we, since Luke and I gave the original talk. We had about 45 back then. Um, and there are 12 deploy packs, which is uh, a way to package up a number of different plugins. Uh, a bunch of different companies are um, creating their own plugin packs when they want to have the same sort of bunch of plugins used across multiple apps. So it's really cool. Uh, and there's a, a couple of different deploy strategies that we sort of talk about in the docs. All right. Uh, last few interesting things. Uh, again, the plugin packs, company use them, and uh, we're just pointing out a few here that you might want to look at if you haven't used Ember CLI Deploy yet and you're interested in bringing it in. And you can see, like, Yap has one with a better lightning strategy with a couple of fancy things, and Zesty automatically deploys the pull request on every deploy to a staging environment, and at PN, the company work for, we automatically fetch the environment variables from a remote server so that we're always in sync, we don't have to store them. Another interesting plugin, this is just one of many, is like the GitHub status one that shows you the little badge. So if you automatically deploy pull request, you can say in the in the pull request you will show passes Travis deployed to the server, you can click and see the deployed version, which is nice. And a couple of things which we want to release, they're private still. Yap wrote a, a deploy bot from Slack, so you can deploy from Slack and it will trigger an AWS Lambda function. 
and then use Travis to deploy. And we wrote internal instead the Sinatra app because we can't use, uh, we need to run on an internal network. And so we hope to release this uh, as soon as possible. So uh, what's coming up? Basically, uh, dry run, which is just an option you're going to be able to pass in to, to just essentially output the order of the, the pipeline's going to run, the plugins are going to run in. Um, so it doesn't actually do anything, but it allows you to verify that your config works and things will run in the order that you expect. Um, we're going to release the, the final version, I guess, of 1.0 docs. Fastboot, lots of people ask how Ember CLI deploy fits with Fastboot. Uh, and we don't actually have a good idea of a good mental model of how Fastboot works. So Tom, uh, I want to chat to you before today's out, please, so you can explain things to me. <clears throat> yeah, Tom's done some good stuff around Ember CLI deploy and Fastboot. Uh, and we want to look at web UI. So there's been a couple that have been created. So we're, we're keen to, to maybe consolidate those um, so we can have a web front end to Ember CLI deploy. So that's all in the pipeline. And that's it. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Currently, I have 300,000 milliseconds, so I have to be quick. So my name is Drew. Hi. You can find me online at Zarkham with a four. Um, I work for a company here in London. It's called Alpha Sites. You should check them out. Um, so what is Elm? How many people here know what Elm is? Come on, bring it out. That's pretty good. Um, so Elm, it's a purely functional language. It reminds a lot of Haskell. Uh, sorry, I should start my timer. Um, start. Awesome. It's optionally typed, so it supports types definition, but it doesn't require to have types. It is monad friendly. Uh, like officially, they, they're not monads, but they're actually monads. So whatever. Um, it's a very mutable language, and therefore it's awesome. And right now I know like what all of you guys are thinking. And yes, it does compile to JavaScript. Um, so yeah, demo. Cool. Basically, you open their website. It's pretty cool. You go to try. Oh, whoa, that was too much. <laughs> Hello world. Um, they have this amazing editor where you can just like type things out and says, okay, um, let's just have some weird. Like, oh, can you actually see? Maybe is this better? Awesome. Um, so yeah, import HTML exposing text. Then we have a main program. It prints out a text. So if you actually inspect this, you'll see that it's actually. HTML, somewhere, script, something. Um, OK, cool. So actually, let's show you how to define a function. You can do add. If any of you guys has done some Haskell, it will like remind you a lot of the syntax. So it's pretty weird. So actually, if you think about it, just look at the implementation. You're going to do something like this. And then we're going to print this out. So we do add one, two, and run this. And it crashes. Uh, but actually, the error message is pretty cool. It says, uh, function text is expecting the argument to be string, but it is int. So to fix that, we can just write to string. And compile again. Boom, fixed. Cool. So um, this is OK. -ish. Like, so basically, if you think, if you read the type of definition again, it's uh, taking two ints, it's returning an int. But what is a bit cooler is that actually you can do like partial applying of functions. So you can do something like this. And this will store a reference to that. So, and actually, <laughs> if you really like Elixir and pipes, you can type pipe stuff and compile, and it works. Uh, not only that, you can also do, let's say I'm going to create another function which adds six, six, four. <laughs> okay. And it adds six, six, four. And here, you can actually do an operation, which is function composition, like the true like mathematical m meaning of the word. So good. Compile. Oh, no. Almost. <laughs> Something with parentheses, I think. Awesome. Um, cool. Um, what is even better than that, you can just rewrite the whole thing. But since um, you, we want to be like special about that, we can also like do it in the opposite way. <laughs> So uh, it supports also <laughs> it also supports um, backwards piping. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, add one, two, and actually it hurts my brain as well because like I don't really know where I'm going to now. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I just go back and show you something else which is, I have three minutes, awesome. So um, you might have heard of this framework, which is called um, React. 
and it's pretty simple. And this is like something quite similar. You have a beginner program which tells you how complex this app is. You pass a model, you pass a view function, you pass an update function. And if you see, like the model is just instantiated as zero, and then you have the update function which is defined here. And actually, see like the type definition in this case is optional because in theory it should be something like this. Oh, I missed um, message, and then takes a model and then returns another model. But the actual concept like underlying that is really similar. So you just like take an update function, you take a view function, and this just works. So if I'm doing this, it works, uh, which is pretty cool. In my last minute, I'm going to show you something really cool, which is um, I have to compile this again, I'm afraid. OK, awesome. So there is a Mario character here. And you see he can jump, and he can move around. And on the left, there's a code which makes the whole thing run, which is 112 lines of code. Not bad. Um, OK, I've made this guy jump a little bit. But now, actually, I'm going to stop time and, rewi and rewind it. And the guy will go back, which is OK. We've seen this. Um, but if I tamper a little bit with the physics engine, and I change this one, and I drag it to something else, you'll see, oh, whoa, Mac OS. Um, you'll see what happens, right? And if you keep dragging, you'll see that all the history and all the actions have been reapplied, and the state has been recalculated and like showing in real time. Since we are not building this sort of stuff every day, you can just think about uh, really complex forms. And uh, instead of waiting for a whole page to refresh and then typing the actions again and clicking all those like weird links again, you can just change the code and see all your changes reapplied instantly. Um, I've put some code here, and there's like more links. There's this repo, which is called Awesome Elm, which you should all check out. And that's it. Just uh, going to start with a quick history about me, and then I'll get into the meat of what I want to actually talk about. My name is Chris Manson. I started using Ember in December 2011. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was just rem reminded of State Manager uh, there today. Ooh, they were good times. Um, yeah, so back then, I actually transferred from Angular, also pre-1.0, uh, but I fell in love with the concepts of Ember and just what the community was trying to do. This was even pre-Router, but just the way that we approached that and we tried different things and kind of progressed, it was really what kind of just draw me to the community. Um, since then, we've come a very long way. You know, we've already had that from Tom and Yehuda at the beginning. Um, I loved the summary that Matthew Beale gave in the Be the Bark, uh, blog post, um, and I, I saw your uh, keynote in EmberConf as well, the fact that you're uh, promoting the sub-teams into official sub-teams and all that, that's really kind of a good progression off the community. Um, after the Be the Bark, after that kind of a concept, I've kind of been thinking about what comes next, and at the uh, risk of torturing the metaphor, I'm trying to think of what the forest looks like. Um, so like a connected ecosystem of different systems that just talk together as one. I don't know, it's kind of getting a bit funny here. Um, but it's, it's all for the same reasons. You know, we want a really first class developer experience for us to get going with applications as quickly as possible. Um, so that's, that's the background. That gives you a little bit of how I feel about all this sort of stuff. Um, so. Right, get to the meat of it. Uh, five years ago, I started my first startup. And when we started it, we were just looking around. And I was just surprised that there wasn't a, a login system that I could just take off the shelf and just use and then get to actually developing what I wanted to develop. Obviously, there were a few sign-in as a service companies out there and products. But they weren't. it didn't f seem to gel with what I wanted out of it and it didn't gel with the community that I was starting to fall in love with at the time. Um, so as, a, as any good developer would do, I built one. Um, and I would like to announce AuthMaker. Uh, it's something that we've been using for the last year or so with four or five clients. It's a little bit battle tested. We have actual running applications in there. Um, it's a system that's really designed to get you going quickly. It solves that problem that I had. You don't want to have to write the login system, the uh, password reset, the confirm email, all that sort of stuff. 
And when I say get you going quickly, I'm thinking, or at least the goal of AuthMaker is to get you going from cold, cold, no application at all, with a full login system in less than two hours, actually deployed and live. Obviously, that's you know standing on the shoulders of guys working on Ember CLI, Ember CLI deploy, the generators and things like that. But the added benefit of AuthMaker is that you can, I expect in that two hours, for you to be able to accept payments. Obviously, you need to put some features into the app so that you can have people pay for something. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the kind of goal. Uh, and the thing that I'm most excited about is that AuthMaker is going to be fully open source. So it's not like these, um, these sign up as a service applications where you can only do it through their proprietary uh, implementation. You can run it yourself. But again, with our goal of getting people up and running as quickly as possible, we're going to give you a way to run it on our servers so that you can get up and running as quickly as possible. Um, like I said, we've got four clients actually using this in production. But we now have to go into the next phase of getting it ready for just general wide adoption, people just t downloading it, running it, seeing how it works. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for about 10 people who are using Ember in the front end. Do, do we know anybody? Um, and, and Node and Express in the back end. Um, ho hopefully, we'll be able to expand that as time goes on, but iterative release cycles and all that, yes. Um, so if anybody is interested in playing around with this, just come and talk to me afterwards. I'll be hanging around a little bit after the conference. So uh, that's, that's it. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. I uh, hope you're not sick of me. Uh, but I wanted to briefly talk about um, an add-on I mentioned in my talk, uh, which was called Ember Chain Set. Um, so if you want to follow along, you can actually try out the demo. Uh, in your browser, it's bit.ly slash ember dash chain set dash demo. Okay, now let me mirror. Can everyone see that at the back? Okay, so ember chain set and ember chain set validations are two add ons that basically make. Um, the process of validating forms a lot simpler. Um, uh, chances are you probably use something like Ember CP validations or Ember validations to validate your forms. And in order to get an experience where uh, you know uh, it's like a nice user experience for uh, editing this form, you actually have to go through a lot of intermediate steps in order to get things to work the way you want. For example, here if you look. Um, to do this out of the box with Ember C or like one of those observer or computer property based validations is kind of hard because um, what happens is the moment the form renders, it's already invalid because the computer property is already running. Um, and then you basically have to write all these like, extra computer properties just to get this really basic kind of uh, form experience working. But uh, with Ember Chain Set, uh, you know, it's a really functional approach. Uh, it's all just functions. There are actually no computer properties or observers at all. Uh, and um, if uh, when I show the code later, uh, it's actually very little code to get this kind of like uh, nice validation behavior uh, right out of the box. Um, yeah. So let me go through the code really quickly. So over here in my application template, I have um, an edit user component which contains my form. And you'll see that uh, it's, actually, it's just a really simple form uh, using the with keyword here. Uh, so I pass in the change set wrapping the user record. And then I also pass in a validation uh, object that I defined, um, which I'll show you a bit later. And then I have a bunch of fields that basically just go through uh, these four properties on the model. Uh, so you can see it's actually a pretty simple template. Um, so let's take a quick look at the validations themselves. So the um, there is a base validator here. You'll notice that it's actually really, really simple. It's, it's, sim uh, it's basically just a POJO uh, with a bunch of keys and uh, validator functions. So here, for example, with the first name property, it's going to run through the presence validator as well as the length validator, uh, which are all just regular functions. And the benefit of this approach is that you can actually compose validations really simple, simply. 
So for example, maybe I have a user which, um, which a user like under the age of 18 that needs to be validated differently from an adult user. So as you can see, I can simply import that base user validations uh, object I defined just now. And then just uh, by using uh, the assign function, uh, I can actually just merge those two uh, objects together and I can get uh, you know, composed validators. Um, and then the actual inputs themselves are super simple. Uh, you could use a, like a native input, you could use the input helper, uh, you could use one-way input, it doesn't really matter because um, the, the, how the chain set works is it essentially checks for the changes to be valid before it gets set on an intermediate object. So you'll notice that when I actually type in this field uh, here, and um, this is the actual data on the record, it doesn't update immediately. Um, and this is kind of like data down actions up in, built into Ember chain set. Because even if I use the input helper, which is uh, two-way bound, uh, this would still work the way you'd expect it to. And then, of course, uh, you know you can't save this record, so I can actually cannot make this invalid. Uh, postman, actually, maybe you give Rob Jackson. Are you postman. So I save it, and Robert Jackson is a paid postman. Cool. Uh, then you can also like if I wait, let me refresh this again. Uh, yeah, if I, if I decide, like, you know, I actually don't want to change, uh, it's super simple to roll it back. And this is all built into Ember Chain Set itself. So as you, as you saw, there is, this, like, so little code here, but you get this really nice form uh, experience just right out of the box. So um, if you're interested, uh, you can try it out. Um, where is my keynote? You can try it out over here. Oops. Yeah, so the link to the add-on is here, GitHub, under the Dockyard uh, organization, and it's ember dash Uh So yeah, I hope you find it useful when you're trying to deal with validations, which I'm sure is a really enjoyable experience. Thank you.